Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Connexus virtual conference. We will be getting started with the keynote address in just 15 seconds or so. We're just giving a little more time for people to get into the meeting. Welcome from across the country. Okay, I'd like to uh, begin today by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands that we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nation peoples that call this land home. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we are and can each in our own way try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I'm excited to be moderate, moderating this session um, at the commencement of the first and hopefully uh, last totally virtual Connexus um, conference. I wanted to thank and commend the Connexus team for all the flexibility, resilience, and adaptability and willingness to learn to do new things that were required to pull off a virtual event of this magnitude. These are skills I'm sure we will be talking about in this session and throughout the entire conference. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we certainly don't have to man mention where you can find the washroom and some other things, but we do want to make this keynote as participatory as possible. So please complete the poll if you haven't already. You can click the poll tab on the, um, on the chat uh, section. Um, make sure you come back to the chat section so you can answer and add your questions when we get to the QA section. There are a lot of people on the call, so I'm sure the chat uh, will be very busy. We will do our best to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the keynote. Um, and once again, welcome to everybody in this uh, first keynote session. I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker. Zabin Hirji is an advisor to business, government, and universities. A recognized thought leader, she advises on leadership and talent, workforce and cultural transformation, lifelong learning, equity, diversity and inclusion, youth employment, and purpose-led organizations. Current roles include Executive Advisor, Future Work at Deloitte, Executive in Residence at Simon Fraser University, Member External Advisory for EDI at UK Research and Innovation, and Chair of Civic Action. Zabine is the former Chief Human Resources Officer for RBC. Her experience across all sectors makes her an ideal keynote to kick off this conference. Zabine is also someone who have I, I, I have tremendous respect for and who I have had the privilege to get to know better over the last few years at events and conferences across the country. Please join me in a rousing virtual welcome to Zabine. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for that kind introduction and good morning, bonjour, and good evening, I think, because we have some uh, participants from, uh, from uh, uh, across the seas. Um, so I am really excited to be able to kick off Connexus 2021. Now, you know, I wish I could see you and feel your energy in your room, in the room. There's, uh, there's something about human connection, face to face, eyeball to eyeball that simply can't be replicated. That said, I can imagine you tuning in from all across Canada and beyond. Um, I can see now the participants have clicked in at over uh, 1100. Um, so it's terrific to, to be in this conversation with you. So I'm going to speak about building a future of work that works for all. Now, I know this is a bold ambition, but I have reason for optimism. The pandemic has shown that united by common purpose 
we've achieved a lot more than we ever imagined as individuals, as organizations, as governments, and as a country. Um, you are a community united by common purpose and the passion to help unlock the potential of people. Now more than ever, as career and employment professionals, as policy makers, you are essential to realizing our country's vision of inclusive prosperity. The work you do is important and you really do inspire me by your dedication to helping people build a better life. And through that, you have this multiplier effect on their families, on our economy and on our communities. Now, as Mark mentioned, um, I spent 20 years in human resources uh, at RBC, uh, and it was really the opportunity to help employees unlock their potential and thrive both professionally and personally that fueled me, that gave me this deep satisfaction and meaning to the work that I did. And that's something we share in common. While this is the first time at the conference for me, I feel like I'm part of this community. This is your moment to reimagine career development, to build inclusive prosperity, to dream big, and to take action to realize your dreams, to turn this moment into a movement. If not now, then when? If not you, then who? So let me talk about the future of work, which has become a bit of a bit buzzword. So I'll start with some upfront framing about three drivers of change, technology, demographics, uh, societal expectations. Now those drivers were already in flight, but COVID has clearly been a time machine to the future. So trend number one, technology, we talk about that a lot. It's pervasive. It's part of everything we do in our lives and it's really having a profound impact. Automation, artificial intelligence, robotics. And as we all know, we were already on this digitization journey, but COVID has, that's probably the biggest acceleration we've seen. In fact, I was speaking with, uh, with someone in, in the grocery industry who said to me, you know, Zabine, our five-year plan was reached in five months. Uh, and that's happening with service providers in the public sector as well. Think healthcare, think education, completely disrupted and then being transformed. So technology is redefining work, what work we do, who does the work and where the work is done. And here are a couple of stats that for me really show the magnitude of the impact. According to the World Economic Forum, at least 54% of employees will need reskilling and upskilling. And an RBC study uh, reported that 25% of jobs in Canada will be heavily disrupted, and 50% of jobs will require significant reskilling and upskilling by 2028. So the bottom line new jobs will be created, jobs will be lost, and the majority of jobs will require new skills. It's less about humans versus technology and more about human machine collaboration, where machines do what they do better and humans do the work that requires inherently human skills. Now, throughout this, this conversation, I will post some questions that I hope are food for thought for you, for things you want to explore at the conference and beyond. So grab a pen or grab your phone and jot these down and use them as conversation starters throughout the conference. So question number one, what role will you play in this massive reskilling and upskilling agenda that's ahead of us? Trend number two, demographic shifts and diversity. Now, one thing is pretty clear in this country and, and frankly around the world, diversity is a fact, inclusion is a choice. We have an increasingly multi-generational workforce. We have the rise of the millennials and Gen Z, those 24 and under now entering the workforce who have different expectations of work. And on the other hand, we have longevity. People are living longer now entering, uh, which means that they'll work longer, um, some out of necessity and some out of choice. 
So question number two, how ready are you to support mature workers with lifelong learning? Canada's racial and ethnic diversity continues to grow. According to the 2016 um, Stats Canada census, 22% uh, of our uh, population or 7.7 .7 million people and growing are visible minorities. And in large cities like Toronto and Vancouver, it's about half their population. By 2031, over 30% of Canada's population is estimated to belong to a visible minority group, with immigration, of course, driving most of that growth. Indigenous peoples make up about 4.9% of the population and are projected to exceed 2.1 million by 2031. And this is very important too. Over 40% are under 24, much higher than other groups. So we have a very young population there in terms of the future workforce. Now we all know that COVID has illuminated the long-standing issues of systemic racism against Black people, Indigenous peoples, and racialized communities. They face many additional barriers, including to education, employment, and career growth. The call to action for equity and inclusion is loud and clear. Employers are ramping up their commitment and importantly, their investments. It's now time for the actions. And my third question to you is how can you partner with employers who are committed to EDI and partner in new and in innovative ways. This area I think is really ripe for reinvention because doing things the same way will not give us different results. Trend number three, changing societal expectations. Something is definitely afoot. I think we all feel it. We were already seeing businesses start to focus more on the expectations of all stakeholders, customers, employees, communities, shareholders, because that's what's expected of them. COVID again, just fast forwarded that. I talked already about the issue of systemic racism and inequities as one example, but we're also seeing momentum gaining uh, around climate change. And, um, so the question there is, what does this mean to new job opportunities and skills development? So three forces of change, technology, demographics and diversity, and changing societal expectations. So with that as the backdrop and the context, let's move to the so what. What does this mean to the work you do? So let me start by double clicking on future skills. The first thing that usually pops into people's minds is technology skills. We have a massive shortage of technology skills already. You're very familiar with that. Data, digital, cybersecurity, and this will only grow. Organizations will continue to recruit for these skills, but they will also need to build pathways within the organization to upskill and reskill their employees. This is not a one and done. This really is a lifelong learning process. The, the second set of skills is uh, digital skills. They're table stakes. We talked about it uh, at the outset. We don't all need to be coders, but everyone needs digital um, acumen to be able to leverage productivity and, and uh, career development tools for teaming, collaboration, knowledge sharing, communication, learning systems, and even basics like email and video calls. We know that um, you know, unmute yourself or you're on mute has become uh, one of the things we're hearing a lot. So, you know, getting really fluent with, uh, with using video um, uh, technology is, uh, is become table stakes. And this is the clincher. We're seeing the rise, the rapid rise of human skills, adaptability, communication, collaboration, curiosity, creativity, growth mindset, empathy, problem solving, resilience. You know, I used to talk about this before the pandemic and, and there were some puzzled or questioning looks, but if we pause to think about the, the, this past year, what are the skills that 
each of us and organization, organizations collectively have drawn on. It is these skills to adapt, to collaborate, to be creative, to learn, to learn from our mistakes, to be curious, to be empathetic, to be resilient. That's what's getting us through. Um, so it's become very clear that in a rapidly changing world, these are the enduring and the transferable skills. Some people call them soft skills. I prefer the term power skills. The most important skill is learning how to learn. This starts with a growth mindset, uh, a belief that perpetual learning is critical, and also the commitment to invest our time, our energy, our resources in skill building. A good analogy for me is health and well being. Over the last couple of decades, we've really built that mindset that preventative actions, proactive actions like regular exercise, good nutrition, sleep, managing stress, are lifelong investments in ourselves. And, and trust me, you know, I talked about the one and done. Exercise does not stop when you leave university. In fact, the more mature you get, the more important it becomes. So we take personal uh, responsibility to fit those activities into our already busy lives. What learnings can be applied to making lifelong learning that kind of a mindset and that kind of an activity? So question number four, how are you building a growth mindset and that capacity to learn, to learn rapidly versus just developing hard skills? And for the employers in the room, is offering learning benefits to all employees the next frontier in building successful organizations? Will it become table stakes like health benefits? This always learning mindset uh, comes to life when learning is built into the flow of work, into the flow of life. It's not just about formal uh, learning opportunities. <clears throat> And um, what people want is bite-sized, targeted, using tools like peer uh, reviews uh, a la open table uh, to serve up the next best offer a la Indigo Books or gamification to motivate individuals. People want a consumer grade experience, think Netflix or LinkedIn. And of course, with this advent of the 100 year life, the model of school, work, retire has been completely disrupted. Longevity translates to people working longer and more likely what we'll see is people coming in and out of the, work, uh, the workforce more frequently. And one of the things that comes to mind there is the challenges that women have faced when re-entering the workforce after taking a career break to raise children full time. And what can we learn from there to overcome those kind of barriers in this world of a hundred year life when that's gonna happen much more frequently? So question number six, is your organization ready to support lifelong transitions for people of all ages? Now I've covered a lot of ground, so I wanna pause here for a moment and, uh, and we're gonna uh, view a, th a three minute video that really does uh, captures a lot of what I've spoken about. Some people learn um, through better through different mediums. So this, this gives that uh, opportunity as well. Um, and there's some new themes that I won't get to that are also nicely captured here. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Jonathan and uh, request him to play the video. Three minutes.
Great, thank you. Um, so the video really, you know, for me, the take, there's a lot of takeaways, but choice, flexibility, one size doesn't fit all. Um, it's, it's critical and, uh, and, and the, the sort of close of it is really around building a future of work that works for all requires all of us to be actors in that process um, and ultimately determine uh, what that future of work is going to look like. Uh, we also know that the pandemic is impacting people in groups very differently. Uh, for example, women, um, many are calling this a uh, she session. Uh, the Canadian Human Rights Commission said these disproportionate impacts could have long term and far reaching consequences. If we are to restore momentum in our efforts to bring about gender equality in Canada, social and economic recovery efforts must take a feminist approach. Young people, Indigenous peoples, people of color and new immigrants have also been harder hit with higher rates of unemployment and reduction of hours. So these are groups that were already facing barriers and COVID has really added to that. So our policies and programs will have to be customized. The, the one size fits all approach won't work. We'll need to put people at the center of the design and really provide wraparound supports to address diverse needs. And of course, this whole notion of partnerships across all sectors uh, will, will be critical to this. So question number seven, is your organization ready to deliver extreme flexibility where one size doesn't fit all? So we've talked about the future of work. We've talked about its many implications. And let me finish off really with talking about your role as change makers and reimagining career development. So COVID, is, as I've mentioned, has really united us in, in this um, common purpose. Um, we're putting the greater good above that of our own. Uh, so question number eight is how can we embed these learnings in our organizations and transport them explicitly to the next normal? Here are some capabilities that I've observed uh, individuals and organizations building. Firstly, unprecedented collaboration within organizations, within sectors, and across sectors. Some silos have come down, or at least they've been lowered. Compassion and empathy, those have been so critical. Uh, we've been adaptable, learning new skills, We've been incredibly agile, stop, think, pivot, act, then rinse and repeat. We've been radically transparent. Leaders um, have created trust through that and empowerment, pushing down decision-making to the front lines. There simply wasn't time for secrecy or carefully constructed communications or hierarchical control. We are resilient. And the punchline here for me is being human is in again. So this realization that we can move fast and effectively, we can test and learn um, versus waiting for the perfect solutions is really beginning to challenge the systemic inertia of organizations, governments, and communities. Embedding these in the next normal could be a great step forward for all of us. Now with my bias for action, I'll, I'll really uh, leave you with these practical steps that you can take to take this moment and turn it into a movement. Remember, leadership is not a title. It is action. It is behaviors. It is role modeling. I know that one of the reasons you gather at Connexus is to share your breakthrough ideas, but also your half-baked ideas, so you can bounce them around and build upon them. Take this opportunity to go outside your comfort zone. Attend sessions that don't fit squarely with your job. Surprise yourself with what you can learn. Be curious. Meet one or two new people every day. Boldly test your ideas. Polish your virtual connection skills. Gather your team, work with colleagues, or create a new team that includes people beyond the usual suspects. The point is to get a group together that you can have meaningful conversations with to sustain you in the long run. Create a North Star to navigate by. 
Choose your values and priorities. Get a manifesto. What are you dreaming of? What is the world you want to leave for your children? And what do you want to aim for? Let your dreams be seen. Use social media, write a blog, stir people up, write articles, do opinion polls, report them, tell individual and community stories of triumph and of failure. Tell your own stories. We all have stories. Get onto panels, webinars, have your elevator pitch. You never know when you can use it. Engage with policymakers, um, with data, powerful arguments, listening. Um, and of course, engage boldly with businesses. Look for like-minded individuals to reach out. LinkedIn is a great place, I find, to really find uh, like-minded uh, uh, individuals. We are the instruments of change. We are at an important inflection point, and you're uniquely positioned in career services, universities, schools, government policymakers, and business. And with Sarah, you've created a community, build on the Sarek national movement. I leave you with my favorite Margaret Mead quote, that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. If not you, then who? If not now, then when. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samin. Uh, that was a really great and very thought provoking um, keynote um, and a great way to open the conference. Um, it was interesting. I'm trying to keep up. I, I need to take a speed reading course, I think, to keep up with the, uh, the questions being added to the chat with so many attendees. But there was a lot of really great feedback and uh, we'll get into some questions. So we have about 15 minutes um, till 1245. We're going to start out with a few questions and I'm also going to try and keep an eye and pick some out of the chat. I'm sure we won't get to all of them, but for those of you on the call, please um, try to add your questions into the chat and we will get to as many as we can. So I'm just going to kind of recap because there are a lot of things that really caught my attention. And I really liked how you actually framed the keynote. So you talked at the beginning about three main drivers of change um, related to the future of work. You then brought us into the so what or what does that mean? And then there was a call to action. You had some really concrete things that we could each do because I think sometimes the challenges that we see around us today can just seem so big and so daunting. And, and we really need to also focus on what can we do? So what agency do we have to actually do something about it? And so that I found really, really helpful as well. So I'd like to first start Zavine with a couple of questions. Um, on the three major um, trends that, that you talked about that are impacting this. And I remember so many future of work events or conferences where uh, one of the only things, not the only thing, but one of the things we talked about was, you know, uh, automation and uh, the robots are coming and, you know, so on. So automation was a big thing. Nobody was really thinking about pandemic or all of the other things that kind of hit us um, unexpectedly. Um, so talk a little bit to me about, you know, you talked about technology. Can you unpack that just a little bit more about the impacts of technology, maybe how it's rapidly changing and so on? What do you think, um, what do you think uh, is something we need to be uh, paying attention to there? Yeah. Yeah, uh, big question. Um, and, uh, you know, I talked about this notion of human machine collaboration and reframing to, to, to that versus, um, you know, humans versus, uh, versus technology. And that is possible if we work together um, across all sectors. Uh, to really collectively create a vision of what we want the future to be and how we're going to help people transition to the new types of work. And some of the technologies, you know, even forget the pandemic, but something as simple as our smartphones 
think about how integrated they are into our lives. We couldn't, I mean, you know, some, when I can see people, I'll often say, how long can you go without using your phone? And uh, it's not very long, but it's the way that it's designed. First of all, we don't need training to use it. It's, it's very uh, intuitive and, uh, and very incremental and test and learn. And um, it's just something that helps us usually be more effective if we spend too much time on it, I guess, maybe not, but, uh, um, and, and, and so I use that, you know, as an example of, of how it's something that needs to be human centric and, and really designed in a way that gets us to use the skills only humans have um, and technology to do the things that they do better but we have to be deliberate about the steps we take to uh, to get to that. Yeah, I really, I, I like the line that you had when you said it's less about humans versus technology, more about human machine collaboration. So really seeing it as an enabling tool, I think is a really important point. I just want to touch on one more of the trends. I know with your background and we've had many conversations, but you've been a lifelong champion of diversity and inclusion. Um, can you talk a little bit more about why inclusion is so important for not only a healthy society that we would all wanna live in, but also for a healthy economy, organization, company? Yeah, you know, I love to speak about that and healthy societies and, um, and strong economies are two sides of the same coin. You can't have um, you can't have one without the other. Uh, but, you know, that said, if you look at the demographics and, and the diversity in the demographics, women are 50%, uh, visible minorities at 22, projected to 30, um, Indigenous people around 2%, and, and of course, other groups, people with disabilities, uh, LGBTQ community, and organizations Canada is a large country with a small population and an aging population. We need to be able to tap into our entire um, talent pool, our entire human capital is really the greatest resource that we have. Uh, and if we're unable to do that, we will not um, achieve uh, the, the same level of quality of life, let alone an improved level of quality life because that's the biggest leverage we have is to unlock the potential of people, of all people. Great, so I want to jump, you, you, there was one section also I found really interesting. You spoke about, and there was a lot of reaction in the uh, chat as well. You spoke about the rise of human skills, um, which we know have always been important, but it, it's really been come to the forefront. Uh, so you mentioned, and you use the term that you like the term power skills uh, instead of soft skills. So I'd like you to maybe unpack that a little bit, but how do you develop those skills and how do you convey them as an individual to employers? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, for in terms of, I, I find language makes a huge difference and soft skills comes with baggage and, or it, it just, I, I don't even think it really describes them well enough. And so I, I like the term power skills because uh, that is that is in many ways our superpower as individuals. Some, we, we can be really good at some of those skills and be able to, to use them and to really be able to use them over, uh, over a long period of time. The thing with hard skills, and knowledge, the half-life is three to five years, which means, you know, three to five years, 50% of it is obsolete. And so uh, they are something that, that really are not enduring. And, and um, so that to me really speaks to that. And if I think of my own career, as, um, as you know, Mark, certainly I moved from many different, across many different parts of the organization, directly in the business side and then into uh, human resources and uh, it was really my, my leadership skills, my soft skills that enabled me to do that because the organization believed that I could learn the new knowledge. And I became somebody that uh, really built that capacity to learn. To your uh, second part of the question, which is how do you build them? 
they're very much experiential. Yes, you can pick up a little bit in a, in a formal classroom, but they are experiential. And so to get really, you know, to the brass tacks and really, really practical, what I say to students who, who speak with me or, or young people, or in fact, anyone um, looking to enter or re-enter or move up in the labor market is be, be clear about the, the human skills you want to develop work with your manager and your colleagues and say, okay, I'm doing, let's take a student, I'm doing this internship for the next four months. I would really like to build my collaboration and empathy skills. So can you provide me with those opportunities through the work that I'm doing? Can you provide me with regular feedback? And can you provide me even with some kind of assessment uh, when I leave so that I can build on that? And the other thing I'll, I'll, I'll put out there, I like to speak in threes, is uh, just how do you create a different narrative? The resume narratives today are, I did this job, this was the nature of the work. I did that job, this was the nature of the work. I did this volunteer, this is what I did. What about a narrative that really creates a thread um, across all of those experiences and, and formal learning that really speaks to the, I have strong collaboration skills. And for example, this volunteer role, I did this, this co-op, I did that. And, and my life experience provided with that opportunity. So it really creates that story that, uh, that's not chronological, but really shows uh, that the human skills coming to life. That's great. Another thing I saw coming up a lot in the um, in the chat as well, where it, it's a question I'm often asked um, as well. What would you um, say to a new graduate or a person from university, college, high school that's graduating? What's the most important skill? And I know you you uh, you talked about and actually said the most important skill to develop is learning how to learn. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. And um, to, to some extent, I think the, the, the half-life of skills and in, in of knowledge, the, the, how that's continuing to shrink really speaks to the need to, um, to, to be able to learn how to learn. And what I would add to that is, and, and, and I actually don't have the perfect language for that yet, and, and you know, would love to hear if, if people do, but for me, part of the learning to learn is creating that love of learning to, to not see learning as a burden or something we have to do. But for, for many of us and for many of you who are at this conference, you're here because you like to learn. You see the value of learn. It's, it's something you actually get energy from. Um, and so that, to me, it's a mindset shift of really seeing learning as, as um, nourishing. I spoke about health and wellness before. For those of us who can see that as something that we actually enjoy to, to, um, and that makes us you know, more healthy, more happy, um, how do we make that happen with learning? But very practically, people often think of learning as just a course. Doing this, this session here, is learning. I learn a lot just by the nature of the questions that uh, that people uh, that people have to offer. Speaking with people without an agenda, curiosity-based conversations. You just never know what you're going to pick up in in that type of a conversation. Yeah, it's very interesting. I just saw somebody made the point in the chat that it, I often make. It's also, I think, at times when we're required to change so rapidly or be resilient and adjust there's also the learning to unlearn so learning new ways of doing point. things but learning to let go of, of ways that used to work well but maybe don't work so well anymore and that that's a really interesting um, thing to think about and if you there's a video um, on YouTube, you can look it up of, of somebody learning how to drive a bicycle and they're driving a bicycle um and you know you can think back to your childhood how long it took to learn to drive a bicycle and then they put um, people that you know were older in life 
obviously had ridden bicycles their whole life and they changed the steering so that when you turn right, the bike actually goes left. And when you turn oh, yeah. left, the bike goes right because it's so ingrained. We don't even think about it when we're driving a bike, but it was really interesting to watch this uh, video of how somebody that's older, it took them, it was almost impossible to unlearn how, you know, the steering wheel and the bike worked. But um, for younger people, it happened much faster. But I think that it, it, there's a really interesting piece in there about learning uh, how to unlearn ways of doing things, learning new ways of doing things. And there've been a lot of uh, discussions. So how do you feel about, you know, there's been a lot of discussion around, you know, resisting uh, the bias against doing new things, right? Uh, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Like, so how do we, how do we become comfortable knowing that we're going to have to become a novice maybe over and over again in our mm -hmm. careers? We're going to have to have that. You talked about, you know, that, that curiosity and everything around lifelong learning. Um, you know, there's a lot of people want to, or we traditionally have thought, you know, you go to school and then you go to work. Um, that's much more blended now. You talked about, you know, work integrated with home, home integrated with work, but also skills development is more integrated across our lifetime now mm -hmm. than, than maybe at certain segments in our life. So, but this all sounds really hard, right? So how do we, um, do you have any tips for how to develop the motivation or maybe it's discipline to practice yeah. these mindsets? So you talk to the mindsets, the growth mindset, the learning mindset, how do we actually create the discipline or motivation to practice these mindsets? Yeah, that's, first of all, we have to be deliberate about it. So I, my agenda is always, I have to learn at least one new thing every day. Uh, sometimes it's in, in my life, it's cooking a recipe, but changing up some ingredients and seeing what might come out of it. Um, so really thinking about that deliberately uh, and start with people who you feel safe and comfortable with. I, uh, I find that being curious and asking dumb questions uh, is a lot easier when you trust the person. I do a lot of mentoring, of course. And when I agree to speak to someone or meet with someone, I make part of the request is come with three questions and one thing you can teach me. And what I say is clearly you reached out to me, you know something about me, you figure out what you think I might want to learn and, uh, and, and help me learn that. Uh, so it, it, it is, and it's different for, for everyone. Uh, and in some ways we do it unconsciously to some extent every day. And we all figured out how to use smartphones. Uh, we all figured out how to, go on online for and many of the folks today would be people who actually work are right at the moment are working from home um, and so we have that capacity and uh, exercise it use it and uh, do it you know with with do it with a gamified in some ways I mean it is um, I, I think it's if you really want to do it I think it's doable Great. Well, I can't believe we're actually at time already and Sandra is going to be flagging me really quickly, but I just wanted to uh, flag one thread that I saw coming through some of the comments and I think it's really important and I wish we had more time to talk about, but is the value that each generation so can bring as well to the conversation. So intergenerational um, knowledge sharing and, and transfer. So where older people have a lot of wisdom to bring, um, more experience and younger people may have more technology. We're really talking about, um, bringing people together. A thread I heard through your entire presentation was collaboration. Um, and you know, people may not want to work till they die, but they may want to be seen as being valuable and, and contributing and, um, you know, uh, and, and nurturing and mentoring and all of those things. So I wish we had more time to talk about that, but we are at time, unfortunately. Um, there was so much more we could have covered, um, but I have one question and we'll close on this. If you could leave one message for people to carry forward from this session uh, for their own personal future of work, what would it be? 
I don't want to be repetitive, but it, it, it is this, this notion of um, really building learning into your DNA. And there's so many different ways. You, you spoke about, uh, about them right now, but making it just like we eat every day, just like we sleep every day, how do you really get explicit about learning? And, uh, and I think it can be a lot of fun. And, and when you build that muscle, you build the confidence. That really gives you confidence to do more, to try more, to, to step out of your comfort zone more, to take on different uh, work opportunities. Uh, so that's, that's I think, and, and I like the term in the video, perpetual learning. Uh, better than lifelong learning because lifelong sounds a bit like a life sentence and uh, um, so I'm you know I'm, I'm sort of looking for that but what I would like to also put out there is um, I'm going to do a post on on uh, LinkedIn with a few of these points uh, I invite participants to to join me on there uh, you know my name Zabine Herji um, to to join me and ask your questions let's have a conversation share what you've learned that's part of my lifelong learning, what you can do for me, what resonated with you, what could I have done differently, what could I have done better, um, because that's the name of the game. And I, you know, asking for feedback is one of the best ways to learn. So please join me and uh, uh, let's continue the, uh, the, the dialogue. And I know Mark will be jumping in as well. So uh, thank you for this amazing opportunity. I can't believe that uh, the time went so quickly. Uh, but I hope you have a great conference and I look forward to, um, to tuning in to some of the sessions myself. That's great. Thanks very much, Sabine. And to everybody that joined us, um, thanks again for joining this session. And we're looking forward to next year seeing those who can come to Ottawa um, and uh, to meet in person uh, when life uh, may be a little bit more normal. Uh, but might not be exactly as it was before. So thank you again for everybody for joining us. Thank you, Zabine. Thanks to the team at Connexus for asking us to uh, do this session um, and take care, everybody.